Good morning. Welcome to church this morning. It's another nice day out there today. A little cooler this morning than we had the last couple of days, but at least it's not raining. And it's a great day to be able to join together, worship God together, and praise Him. Uh, as you might have noticed already this morning, uh, Pastor Lewis is away. He just had surgery on his sol- shoulder. That's like a tongue twister. Surgery on his shoulder uh, on Thursday. And uh, he's just recouping from that. And just uh, he had a little bit of reaction to some of the anesthesia. And he's all right and everything like that. But it was supposed to be a pretty quick procedure. He ended up being in the hospital for about 12 hours on Thursday instead of two hours. But uh, just keep him in his prayer. He's, he's doing well, just recovering. He said, actually, the pain is not nearly as bad as he thought, and he's just on minor uh, painkillers and things like that. But I'm going to be filling in this week and next, and God's put a message on my heart uh, that I want to share with you as we continue on this morning. But just before we get to worship this morning, I want to share a few announcements, a few events that are coming up. Uh, as you've probably heard, and we've been announcing it for quite a while now, the Hearing God Seminar is coming up this upcoming Friday evening and Saturday morning. And so uh, if you're still interested in that, you still have time to register, we ask that you try to register maybe by Wednesday this week just so we can get the seating arranged and get everybody uh, where they need to be. We have about 20-something people registered right now from our church in Northgate and uh, fellow other uh, churches in the area. And we're just excited to be able to learn more about hearing God and being attentive to his voice. And so be excited about that. It's uh, free of charge. So if you're still interested in that, or if you don't want to come here in person, we will be streaming it online as well for those at home or those who want to stay at home. And you can watch during those times as well, live. Um, Secondly, Family Matters. We had our first one a couple of weeks ago. The next one is coming up on November 3rd, and it's just an evening where we can join together as families. I'm sharing with parents, and we're just sharing heart of how to influence and invest in our children greatly, and there's great ministry happening in the back of the church as well for our children. And thirdly, this morning is uh, the shoe boxes. We've been announcing that, but just uh, you can see on the slide behind me just the details of when the boxes need to be in. Thank you for those who have already picked up boxes, and many have gone out, and some have come back, but we just ask, uh, continue to fill that, continue to uh, fill those needs that's going to be going out and blessing so many children uh, this year as we just serve God and be able to give and invest in that way. I'm going to turn it over to Randy, and uh, he's just going to lead us into worship this morning. I was just encouraged as they were practicing. I never shared with him what I'm preaching about, but many of these songs just reflect about the grace and the mercy of who God is. And So let's just worship him and reflect on that this morning. Thank you, Nathan, Pastor Nathan. Um, I know we're all here with masks, and we're, everyone's supposed to be afraid to breathe and touch one another and everything, but... We can, we can shake our bodies and raise our arms and stamp our feet. I said this again last week, I'll say it again. Uh, we're, we're made to praise Jesus with uh, our, our hearts and our minds and our bodies. Uh, and that includes in, in music. And uh, we may not be able to sing out loud, but I don't think there's anything saying we can't hum really loud. But if you would stand with me right now, please, uh, we're going to sing a song called This is Amazing Grace.
amazing grace. for God's grace there. <laughs> I apologize. I messed up the lyrics quite a bit there. I apologize. But uh, the Lord knows what's in my heart, I hope, today. I know that he does. He's a God of grace and mercy. And, uh, you know, it wouldn't matter to me if I stood up here and looked just like an absolute fool. I'm here worshiping the God that has saved me from the bondages of many, many, many things in my life, and uh, I know I'm no different than all of us out there, so praise the Lord. God, the 
light of the world and all our This is Psalm 145. Great is the Lord. He is most worthy of praise. No one can measure his greatness. Let each generation tell its children of your mighty acts. Let them proclaim your power. I will meditate on your majestic, glorious splendor and your wonderful miracles. Your awe-inspiring deeds will be on every tongue. I will proclaim your greatness. Everyone will share the story of your wonderful goodness. They will sing with joy about your righteousness. The Lord is merciful and compassionate, slow to get angry, and filled with unfailing love. The Lord is good to everyone. He showers compassion on all his creation. All of your works will thank you, Lord. All your faithful followers will praise you. They will speak of the glory of your kingdom. They will give examples of your power. They will tell about your mighty deeds and about the majesty and glory of your reign. For your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. You rule throughout all generations. The Lord always keeps his promises. He's gracious in all he does. The Lord helps the fallen and lifts those bent beneath their loads. The eyes of all look to you in, help, in hope. You give them their food as they need it. When you open your hand, you satisfy the hunger and thirst of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in everything he does. He is filled with kindness. The Lord is close to all who call on him. Yes, to all who call on him in truth. He grants the desires of those who fear him. He hears their cries for help, and he rescues them. The Lord protects all those who love him, but he destroys the wicked. I will praise the Lord, and may everyone on earth bless his holy name forever and ever.
Thanks so much, Cheryl. That was powerful. One more song, and then we're going to uh, hear Pastor Nathan's message. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you only. God, you are great and worthy to be praised. Lord God, every breath that we have, Lord God, every moment, Lord God, may we come into that understanding that, that you want us to acknowledge you in all of it, in all of our life, in every situation, to praise you, to come to you with our needs and our burdens, to come to you and confess just our need and our dependence on you. Great are you, Lord. There is no one like you. There never will be. There never has been. The Lord of lords, the King of kings. God, may our hearts just exalt. Hallowed be your name. God, today may we come and bring needs before you. Lord, there are still those who are, who are sick in body. We think of Shelley Moore, Lord God, and the cancer and the treatments she's undergoing. Lord God, just the toll that it's taking on her physically. I'm sure emotionally, Lord God. Lord, we just pray that you just come and meet her need in a powerful way. May your name be glorified above all else. Lord, may she be able to testify of your goodness, of your presence, Lord God, in times of trouble in your strength when she is weak. Just come and meet her where she is. We continue to pray, Lord God, for Shirley Varco. Lord God, we pray you just come and be around that family. Be with her physically, Lord God, in this situation, Lord. May you just draw people onto yourself. May, may they come and know your presence and know your peace in a powerful way. We continue to pray for Vic North. So he's gone under, undergone treatment and, and surgery, Lord God, on his kidney. God, we just pray you just be with him physically and emotionally. Lord God, just be with him. May your presence be known. May strength just rise up in him, Lord God. May he take heart. And Lord, as was passed to me this morning, just for a need, Lord God, related to Ken Norm. Lord God, there's a daughter who, who died, who is missing. Lord God, we just pray for comfort for that family as they mourn, as they grieve, Lord God, this loss. Lord, I don't know where they stand with you. I don't know if they recognize you and acknowledge you as their Lord. But God, I pray that you come and minister. May your Holy Spirit come and rest in that situation today. Lord, may the peace that passes all understanding just come and comfort them and bring strength. And Lord, just for the remainder of this service, may your name be lifted high, Lord God, as we look into your word. May we come to a deeper understanding, even as we were singing this morning, even as we were worshiping, Lord God, just truly the sacrifice that you made, the grace that you provided, and how we can live in freedom and liberty. Lord, just use this message for your glory. In your precious and holy name, amen. I'm just going to dismiss the children to uh, Kids Church this morning. And just, uh, just recognize, it's from uh, 
so four years old, junior kindergarten to grade five, any other younger children who are here with their families, uh, the nursery is unlocked and open. We don't have nursery workers per se, but if you need to use that, if your child uh, just needs a place to, uh, to go and to rest for a little bit, then please utilize that. But uh, Kids Church, we're running from junior kindergarten age, so four years old, up till uh, grade five. We just pray that God blesses them as uh, Patty pours in their life and they learn more about God's grace today. I can just get my PowerPoint up behind me there. Thanks, Rachel. So we're going to continue on with this series. We've been doing a series on how we should pray. Oh, Lord, teach us to pray. About how the disciples went to Jesus and they asked him, Lord, we want to know how you connect with God. We want to know your heart. We want to know how you relate, how you speak to your Father. Lord, teach us to pray. And Matthew 6, 9 to 13 says, this then is how you should pray. Jesus says, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we, as all, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. We've been looking over the last number of weeks as Pastor Lewis is bringing, bringing us through on these points of how we need to pray for God's name to be hallowed, how he is set apart, how he is holy, how we praise him and worship him. How we pray for God's kingdom to come. How we ask for his will and his way and we look to him. We know that his will will be done, but we want to come in alignment with that. We want to come in right understanding of what he has planned and that our spirits are able to be used and utilized to see his kingdom come. Pray for his will to be done on earth. And Pastor Lewis, the last couple of weeks, has been talking about pray for our daily bread, for our provision thanking him for how he takes care of us, how he, he provides for us daily in every need. And today and next week, I want to be speaking about this next part, talking about daily forgiveness, talking about forgive us our debts. And then next week, I want to talk about as we forgive those, our debtors, or those who trespass against us. I don't think I'm the only one, and maybe I'm a little bit sadistic, but... but Stick with me. I like to watch blooper videos. I like to watch fail videos. Sometimes I sit there on YouTube, and I like when people fall flat on their face. Am I allowed to say that? Am I allowed to say that? I don't know. But, uh, but there are times where, okay, I can't be the only one. There are times where it's kind of fun to watch, or after a movie or something. Sometimes they even have that little blooper reel or outtakes or something like that. And there's something fun, there's something funny. Not when somebody gets seriously hurt, that's sadistic. But just if somebody tries something and they fall short, there's almost something in us that we're like, ha, ha, ha. And we chuckle and we laugh and we, we kind of rejoice in their failure. Why, why is that? But I really think that whether it's Olympic fails or blooper videos or sports fails or America's Funniest Home videos or, or whatever it might be, there's something that we can relate to when people fall short of a standard. I mean, we all have personal standards. We all have goals. We all have things that we achieve to do. And sometimes we don't reach that mark. Sometimes we don't reach that standard in our lives. There's a YouTube channel called Fail Army. And uh, it's a YouTube channel that's just dedicated to fail videos. People who are trying things and can't get it right. Maybe it's because it humanizes us all. It brings us to this relatable way that it's like, okay, I'm not the only one who isn't perfect. I'm not the only one who tries at things and I, sometimes I just blow it. Sometimes I come so close and it's so disappointing. But we all fall short. It's part of our human nature that we fail at times. See, each one of us have those personal standards or goals or marks or achievements that we want to reach. And when we fall short... We feel this shame or discouragement or, or doubt in our abilities. We say things like, well, I could have done better, or I should have done this, or I should have done it that way, or if this didn't happen, then, then I would have hit the mark. 
And this morning, I don't want to just talk about skateboarding blooper videos. I don't want to just talk about uh, blooper reels. But what I want to talk about is a higher standard. I want to talk about God's standard for our life and this thing called sin. About this place where God sets a standard for us. And I don't know about you, but in my sinful nature, in my human nature, there are times where I, I, I love God. I trust you love God and you want to do what's right. You want to honor him with your life. You want to honor him with your thoughts and your mind and all that you are. But yet sometimes we're going along really good and we miss the mark. We mess it up. We have all the right intention, but yet in our sinful nature, we fall short. We fall short. And so I want to talk today, well, what do we do when we fall short? We were singing these songs today to know his grace and his mercy. And that's where I want to go today. On this idea of, Lord, forgive us of our debt. So what do we do when we sin? What do we do when we miss the mark? Romans 3.23, we probably know it really well. It says, for all have sinned, oops, sorry. <laughs> for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I mean, we don't have to look too far in our past Probably for me, it was this morning. I was losing my patience a little bit with Nolan. I was trying to get out the door, and he was just, he said he wanted to come with me, but he wasn't getting ready. And just this morning, I fell short. I lost my patience. I got aggravated at him. I'm just like, get your shoes on. We've got to go. <laughs> and uh, it's not too hard to look in our, in our history and look in our lives and say, oh, man, I could have done better. I should have done better. I Oh, I missed the mark. I didn't communicate with him in grace and love and peace, and there's a better way to do this. I messed it up. Not that it can't be redeemed, and I asked for his forgiveness, and we worked through it. But yet all of us fall short. Maybe it's lies that we've told. Maybe there are times in our lives where we have intentionally cheated and deceived. Maybe there are times where there's just this eternal rhythm and this eternal pattern in our lives that takes place. It's that we don't want to think on these things. We don't want to go there. We don't want to do that. But we end up, ah, our sinful nature is in conflict with our spiritual nature. We want to do what's right, but we can't do what's right. And Paul writes that way. What I want to do, I don't do. What I do, I don't want to do. But all of us fail at times. It's just part of who we are. And I don't want to beat a dead horse. I don't want to, I don't want to labor on that. But I want to just paint that picture that that's the reality of the sinful nature of our world. We live in a sinful world. We are sinful people. We have a sinful nature. But yet... <laughs> There is something that we can do about that. Some of the coping mechanisms that we have when we fail, when we sin, is sometimes we try to ignore the sin. Maybe you're in that boat that we just try to pretend, oh, it never happened. We try to just erase it and try to not think about it and just, oh, I'm just going to move on. That never happened. I never said that. I never did that. I never thought that. We just kind of want to keep pushing on. But you and I know there are times where we lay awake at night or we lay there at night and the guilt and the shame and the remembrance of, oh, we just know that we've done something. We know we've fallen short. Sometimes we try to rationalize it, and that's a big thing in our culture. I spoke on this a few months ago. But we, we try to just say, well, sin's not a big deal. Or we try to say, well, everybody does that. Everybody thinks that way. Everybody just try to cut corners to get where they need to go. Everybody, everybody does this. It's not really that wrong. It just can't be avoided. I mean, it's everywhere. So how am I supposed to not give in to temptation? Sometimes we blame other people. Well, if that person wasn't just such a jerk, then I wouldn't react the way I do. I wouldn't get angry at them if they were just... <laughs> But yet, we can't blame others because at the end of the day, we sit there and we say, well, no, it's, it's me. I, I have the condition that I need to work out with God and I need to work out with people. Amen. It's easy to, to try to blame others. But we know in those quiet moments, it's, it's not other people's fault. It's how we react. And so I just want to present this to us that, that it's true that there is a debt that we owe. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. 
So we can't ignore that fact. We can't say, oh, well, I'm righteous and I'm holy all the time and I'm perfect. And <laughs> We have to realize there, there is sin in our lives and there is a debt that we need forgiveness from. Sometimes we try to repair it. Sometimes we try to fix it. Sometimes we try to do everything in our strength and our effort to make it right. And so this is where Jesus teaches the disciples to pray. And this is where I want to focus today. It's only five words that I want to look at today, but I think it's so packed full. It's, it's the gospel and the redemption of God. Jesus says, when you pray, pray like this. He says, forgive us our debts. Forgive us our debts. What this shows is that Jesus understands our human condition. He even says he was tempted while he was in the wilderness. He did not give in to temptation, but he understands what temptation is. He understands the struggle of being in a sinful world and temptations being all around us. And so when Jesus teaches his disciples to pray, he's telling them, I understand you have a human condition. You have a condition, a spiritual condition where you fall short. But here's the solution. So when you pray, you can say to God, forgive me, forgive me of my debt. You see, God is not distant from our temptations or our struggles. And he teaches them that when they are to pray. Last week, the last few weeks, Pastor Lewis has been talking about this daily bread, about physical needs and about the things that we need and how he provides for us. But what I love is on that very next line, Jesus then transitions into, forgive us our debts. And Jesus is inviting us daily to know his grace and know his mercy and know he provides forgiveness and grace for our sinful condition, that our debt that we have, we can bring to God. We can come to him with boldness and we can say, God, I fell short. In all humility, and all brokenness, we can say to him, I just can't get it right, but God, I want to present to you daily, every day, forgive me of my debt. Forgive me of my debt, the wrong things I've done, the list of things, my shortcomings, all the sins which I fall short of God's standard. God, forgive me of my debt. And so right after asking for the fundamental building blocks of life and our daily needs and the things that we need, he then turns to our spiritual condition and says, God provides for that as well. He provides a way. He provides forgiveness for our sins. Forgive me of my debt. Would you shower me in your grace and in your forgiveness? Jesus asks us to come boldly to God and ask him and talk to him and work through our salvation. Not to ignore it, not to blame other people on it, not to try to fix it ourselves, but just to come in prayer and say, God, I need you. Every hour, every moment, man, I was going, I was doing so well, and then, oh, I did it again. <laughs> I fell short again. And as I was reading in commentaries this week, a powerful thing popped out to me. Because we live on this side of grace. We understand Jesus died on the cross. We know his blood, his resurrection. We know that we can be free in Christ. But what I love is when he is speaking to the disciples, they didn't know that yet. They, they, haven't, they hadn't seen the sacrifice that he had made. And so Jesus says to them, you can come to God and he will forgive your debt. To these Jewish guys, I think, Light bulbs are going on, or they're just like, we can't do that. We're not allowed to do that. That's not what the Pharisees say. That's not what the Old Testament says. I have to go through my rituals. I have to present myself to the priest. I have to do a sacrifice. I have to go through ever, all these motions to be able to be forgiven and seen right in God's eyes. But Jesus says something so radical. I'm sure afterwards they had questions, and they were probably talking to each other like, What's he getting at? What's he talking about? How, how can that be? How can I just come to God and say, forgive me of my debts? And they're gone? I, I can just come to God and know his grace and they're gone? Yes. <laughs> and Jesus is laying the foundation for reconciliation. He's laying the foundation for grace. 
I don't think they fully understood what he was saying in that moment, but we do. On this side of grace, we understand that we can come to him because he is our high priest, Hebrews says. He intercedes on our behalf. We can ask him through his blood and through his death, through his grace, forgive us. And we are forgiven. We are forgiven. It's not in our own strength, but coming to him and confessing. Who here is thankful that it's not up to us? I'm thankful that it's not up to me to make this right with God. Because I can't do it. I can't do it on my own. And this is, I want to look into a few scriptures this morning. Look at the way that Paul the Apostle writes to the church. Because it just goes hand in hand with what Jesus is presenting to his disciples in the Lord's Prayer. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 13 to 14, it says, When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled. And really, the root of this Greek word canceled means literally to obliterate. It, it no longer exists. And I love that because that's what the cross does. It leaves no trace of the debt. So it says, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us, he has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. When we say to him, forgive me of my debt, it's not as though like a debt I have in my mortgage. If the bank called me up and said, hey, Nathan, I want to introduce you a new mortgage rate, and I can do better for you, or I can give you lower monthly payments, I'd probably jump at that. But it doesn't eliminate my debt. <laughs> but if they called up and said, hey, you know what, in grace and mercy, somebody took it upon themselves and they paid for everything. You no longer owe us a cent. That would be amazing grace. And this is what Jesus does. He, he takes it and he says, your debt is gone. It's erased. There is no more trace of it. You can let it go. We looked at before Romans 3.23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I'm so thankful that it doesn't end there. Let's continue to read. It says, And all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. And he did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time. So as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. The reality is that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But the other reality is he is faithful and just to forgive all our sins. To take it all, all our shame, all our guilt, everything that we hold on to, and he erases it. He erases the debt. And that's something to be excited about. That's something to praise about. That's what we were singing about today. Jesus, Messiah. This is amazing grace. And this is what he is saying to his disciples. You see how I'm ministering to people? You see how I'm healing people? You see how I'm touching people? Blind people are seeing. Deaf people are hearing. People are standing up and walking. People are being set free of physical ailments. But guess what? I have more in store. I want to come and not just meet these external needs. We talked about that with daily bread. But I've come to seek and to save the lost. I've come for those who are broken and who have this spiritual condition that they can't fix on their own. The Pharisees have their list of rules. Since the Old Testament, I have given you the law and I've given you my standard, but you can't do it on your own strength. You've tried. You need me. You need a savior. And he will forgive us of our debt. But there's a second aspect that I want to look at today. Because I, I pray and I trust that each one of us in this room have accepted that grace for ourselves. We've asked Jesus to come and cleanse us of our sins. 
I want to remind us that we can do that daily. It's not a one-time thing when you're five years old. But every day when we fall short, we can say to him, God, I need to know your grace. It's new and rich every morning. But then the second aspect I want to touch on today is we can know his forgiveness, but how do we forgive ourselves? Because as I said before this morning, I still have the memory of how I lashed out at Nolan. I still have the memory of how I lost my cool, how, how I fell short. And I remember that. I've asked for forgiveness. I made my heart right with God. I made my heart right with Nolan. But I still can talk about it. I still remember it. It wasn't erased. It's not a blank slate in that sense. So how do we forgive ourselves? Because here is what I, I struggle with, maybe. I don't know if that's the right word, but I sense in my own life, and I think you probably do too, that there are times where we know his grace, we sing about his grace, we exalt him for his mercy and grace, but we don't live in his grace. We don't live in freedom. We don't live like those who have been released of a debt. We think, well, there's got to be a string attached I get off the phone with my mortgage broker, off the phone with my bank, and I'm like, okay, what's the deal? There's got to be something. Or, uh, well, no, I owed, I owed all this. I, I had this many thousands of dollars of debt. How can, it can't just be erased. I'm thankful, but, it, but I struggle with this idea of actually receiving his grace and letting it go and allowing myself to live in freedom and grace. And this is where the enemy, I think, has a hold in so many people's lives because he wants to convince us <laughs> that we are still guilty. He wants to convince us that we should still be ashamed. He wants to see us live in shame. He doesn't want to see us live in freedom. He's the enemy of our soul. His purpose is to tear us away from God and to lead us away from God. He wants to rub our nose in it. He wants to remind us of everything we did, but yet the Bible says there is no condemnation to those who belong to Christ Jesus. In Romans 8, verse 1. And because we are guilty of sin, doesn't mean we have to be carriers of shame. I'm going to say that again. We can be guilty of sin. We said that. We all fall short. We all have a debt. But we are not called to be carriers of shame. Because you see, there is a significant, significant difference that I want to bring to your attention today. That there is a difference between godly conviction, <laughs> when the Holy Spirit convicts us of our sins and tells us, you know what, you fell short. We, we need that. The Holy Spirit needs to speak to us. It needs to say, okay, you need to get right. You need to get on track with God. And there is godly conviction, but then there is worldly shame. The Holy Spirit convicts us, but the devil condemns us. So there is a significant difference between godly conviction and worldly condemnation. 2 Corinthians Chapter 7 tells us this. It says, Godly sorrow brings upon repentance. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. But worldly sorrow brings death. Godly sorrow. Godly sorrow meaning that when I mess up, when I fall short, when I have a debt that I can't pay, I should be struck in my heart. I want the Holy Spirit to convict me and tell me, Nathan, you need to get this right. You need to come to me. You need to know my strength. You need to know the Holy Spirit in your life. And so godly sorrow and conviction leads us to repentance. And really repentance is saying, you know, I'm going to turn away from what I was doing. I want to turn away. I want to do better. I need to involve myself and get my thoughts so involved in what God's standard is, that I know when I'm getting close to sin. I'm not flirting and tempting with, well, I can get this close to it before I fall in, <laughs> before I fall into sin. 
But it's saying, Holy Spirit, convict me so much that when I'm back here, when even my mind and my thought is starting to lead towards that, Holy Spirit, bring godly sorrow into my life. And that's not comfortable. Sometimes it's nice to just feel the joy of the Lord all the time. But there are times where I'm broken before the Lord, and I'm sure you have been too. I see David who says to the Lord, like, search me and know me and know my anxious thoughts. Know if there's something wrong in me. And lead me on paths of righteousness. We need to have that prayer. We need to, that's where it's, Jesus is talking about. Forgive us of our debts. Godly sorrow brings repentance. But worldly sorrow brings death. The enemy wants to see us live in shame. The enemy wants to tear us down. He wants to get us in a place and get us in the corner where sin is not just what we've done. I have sinned and I have fallen short of the glory of God. The devil wants to make us think you are sin. You, you are wrong. Not just that you did something wrong, but everything about you is wrong. Look at you. You're shameful, disgraceful. You keep repeating the same sin. What is wrong with you? And maybe you have those voices in your head like I do in mine sometimes. And it's easy to just listen to and be like, yeah, you know, I can never overcome this. Or I... And we begin to fall into defeat. But Jesus is saying, I want you to be victorious. I've come for freedom, and for freedom I've set you free. So I want us to recognize what that is for what it is. The enemy wants to, us to live in shame. Nowhere in the gospel does Jesus put shame on us. As I said, Romans 8, there's no condemnation to those who belong to Christ Jesus. I want to finish with this story that you probably know quite well. But we look at the story of Peter. And many can probably relate to Peter. I know I can. Peter was a guy who had a lot of zeal, a lot of passion, a lot of good intentions. He, he wanted to have Jesus back. He was a fighter. He had good spirit, and he, just, he wanted to do what was right. He was so thankful that he could be a disciple. Jesus was teaching him. He, he was pure in that way. But he, he could be going along so well, and then suddenly he does something like dumb on steroids. He just blows it. And that's me sometimes. It seems like I'm, I have the passion, I have the zeal. And then, oh, man, I can't believe I did that again. I can't believe I dropped it again. And so this is Peter. And unfortunately, this can be me, maybe you this morning. But he's kind of bragging on himself to Jesus. He's saying, Jesus, wherever you go, whatever you do, I've got your back. No matter what, no matter what comes against us, I'm always going to have your back. I'm never going to deny you. I'm never going to forsake you. I'm always with you, Jesus. I'm your man. I'm the man. And Jesus looks through his pride, looks at him straight in the eye and prophesies, Peter, relax a little bit. Because before the rooster crows, you're going to actually deny me three times. And that's exactly what happens. We know the account. Jesus gets arrested. The pressure is on. The soldiers are pressing in. They've taken Jesus captive. And suddenly, as a believer of Jesus, they're in hot water. And a little girl looks at Peter and he says, weren't you that man who was with Peter? And Peter says, Jesus who? I don't know who that is. I don't even know what you're talking about. Get away from me. Another woman comes up and says, hey, yeah, you're one of the disciples. Weren't you walking with Jesus? I, I'm pretty sure I saw you. Peter said again, I have no idea what you're talking about. You're, you're ridiculous. You're, you're out of your mind. And then another man comes and he says to Peter, in Luke 22, verse 59, another person came and asserted, certainly you were with Jesus. Certainly you're a follower of Jesus, for he's a Galilean. And Peter replied, man, I don't know what you're talking about. 
And just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed. And something that stuck out to me, in Luke 22, verse 61, so after this comes, suddenly that realization, wait a second, <laughs> I, I dropped the ball. Suddenly the guilt and the shame and that realization that maybe I'm not as <laughs> much Jesus' man as I thought I was. In verse 61, it says the Lord turned and he looked straight at Peter. Jesus looked straight at Peter, but not with condemnation. I think that the look was just one of sorrow, of realization, of mercy and grace, that he looked at Peter and said, not rubbing his nose in it, not being like, I told you so, but just a compassion saying, this is why you need me. This is, this is why I have to be captured. This is what's about to happen is for you, Peter, and for all the world. He looked straight at Peter, and it said that Peter remembered what the Lord had spoken. Before the rooster crows today, you're going to disown me three times. And then godly sorrow set in. It said Peter went outside, and he wept bitterly. He wept bitterly. It was a godly sorrow. I can't believe that I actually did that. Jesus even warned me, and I still gave in. I still denied him. How could I do that? I'm so dumb. I'm so stupid. I'm never going to get this right. Jesus is never going to look at me the same way again. I blew all my ministry chances. I blew everything. And that's the crossroad. <laughs> that's the place where we need to know the conviction of God. We weep bitterly and we confess our sins to him. But at that place, that's where the enemy is going to try to meet us at the corner and say, yeah, and now follow me. <laughs> because you're never going to get better. He's never going to forgive you. He's, you can never make up for what you did. Now he's going to be dragged off and he's going to be killed. And we see this crossword where the enemy can get into so many of our lives. This place where the enemy begins to speak to us and we begin to define ourselves by our shame and our guilt. But Jesus says, when you pray, pray like this. God, forgive me of my debt. God, I have fallen short of your glory again. I'm trying so hard. I'm trying. I'm trying. But I just can't get it right. A godly sorrow and a conviction comes in that the Holy Spirit convicts us of our sin. But God wants to take us in our guilt and he wants to draw us to his grace. Godly sorrow says, I don't want to do that anymore. I have a safe place to turn and we recognize and we know that God is our safe haven, that we can come to him and confess our sins and he is faithful and just to forgive us of all our sins. His mercies are new every morning. The enemy wants to come in and he wants to say to us, you're guilty. Lock him up, throw him away. You're, this is who you are. This is what defines you. Every wrong thought, every time you lose your patience, every lustful thought you have, every time you dropped the ball, that's who you are. But as I read the gospel, as I read what Jesus says, he says we are redeemed. We are sons and daughters of the king. We are a holy people, a holy nation, set apart. Not once does Jesus look at somebody who comes in confession and redemption and, and asking for his grace and say, okay, first, let me tell you who you are. Right away, he says, you are forgiven. I love you. I receive you. Come to me. Even this morning, Nolan and I, when we were driving in, he was asking me, he said, we saw the cross on top of our church. He said, oh, why do some churches have three crosses, two little ones and one big one? I was telling him about the two thieves on the cross and Jesus being in the center. And I shared with him the story of the thief on the cross. One of them still died in his rebellion and in his sin. The other one, right at the very end of his life, living a life of sin and thievery and deceit, 
turned to Jesus and said, remember me today, remember me. And Jesus didn't say, oh, yeah, I'll remember you, you stinking thief. <laughs> Jesus looked at him and said, yeah, you, today you're going to join me because he saw repentance. And this is what I want to finish with and what I want to ask us today. Do I daily pray for grace? That we understand that this is a free gift, that it's not a one-time gift. That's what Jesus is saying. When you pray, we've been talking about that. Lord, teach me to pray. Prayer isn't a one-time thing. I don't pray once. I don't want to pray once a week. But daily as I'm coming to the Lord, do I pray for his grace? Do I come to him in each moment and say, God, I, I need your grace to do what's right. I need your grace and forgiveness because I didn't do what was right. But then the second part of that is, do I live in the freedom that Christ has provided? And this week, as we go from that place, go from this place, I want us to reflect upon that. I want us, as you're going through the prayer, I've been doing this a lot more lately as we've been doing this sermon series I'm praying the Lord's Prayer, but slowly, methodically, thoughtfully, and actually looking through and, and understanding more depth into what the Lord's Prayer is saying. Do I daily pray for grace? Do I understand that I don't have to live in guilt and shame and condemnation? But who the sun sets free is free indeed. And once we understand how freely we are forgiven and how freely we can live, then we can then release that forgiveness to other people. And that's what we're going to talk about next week. <laughs> that's next week's sermon. Is I want to talk about forgive us our debts as we forgive those, our debtors, those who have trespassed against us. So next week, that's a loaded sermon as well because that's a hard thing to get through as well. <laughs> Let me close this in prayer this morning. Lord, I thank you today how you orchestrate, Holy Spirit, even the songs that you put on Randy's heart. And as we were singing this morning, Lord God, this is amazing grace. Jesus, Messiah. God, this is who you are. You came and you laid down your life for our sake. And Jesus, when you teach us to pray, as we adopt this into our prayer life, may we understand your mercies every single day. May we understand, Lord God, that we don't have to be defined by our guilt and our shame and our actions, but God, we can bring it to you, we can confess it to you, and you will forgive us of our sin. Holy Spirit, I thank you how you guide and lead us and teach us what is right. I pray for endurance and the fruit of the Spirit that gives us the strength so that we will not continue in that pattern of sin, but we may be free and live by the Spirit. But Lord, I thank you so much that it's not up to us, not up to our strength, but you provided a way. So thank you for showing us the way and teaching us how we can call out to you. And Lord, may we leave this place understanding who we are in you, understanding the freedom of Christ, understanding who you say we are, and to live in that. Because as we live in that, Lord God, that's how we can extend grace to other people. So Lord, be with us today. May your mercies be new for each person through every situation, every conversation we have. May it be just seasoned with grace. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I pray you're blessed today and uh, have a great, great rest of the day.